so today, I'm, I'm sort of bouncing around <laughs> between things that are easy and things that are incredibly hard and things that are easy. So the first few slides today are, are easily accessible. They just sort of are giving you an overview of the singularity and singularity theory. So what, what are the various ways of thinking about how this could occur? Then we, we, we get into the meat of, of Marcus Hutter's uh, presentation. I, I've taken some of his slides, integrated them into my talk, and, and I'm just giving you kind of a top-level overview. We're not really getting into the details of that. And then at the end, we're going to talk about Future Day, which is mainly a fun uh, topic. How could we create a new holiday to to interest the general public in the idea that they should start thinking about the future, planning for uh, the future. So that's the plan of what we're doing today. You've seen this slide before, so the technological singularity is the idea that machines will one day be smarter than we are. There's already considerable evidence that, that machines are better at chess, they're better at checkers, they're better at Jeopardy, it's not just mostly they're better, they're permanently better. They, they are better than all human beings in the world at those entities. They're able to play perfectly. They could play better than any human being could ever play. And so we're getting more and more things that machines are better at than human beings. And I pointed out that some of the pictures, these still pictures taken by this camera fall in that, that um, category. The best still pictures you see of what goes on in this course are taken automatically by that camera looking at the image of the video shooting, seeing that it fits a pre-assigned algorithm of what that software <laughs> considers a good picture and taking a picture without a human being doing anything. So the more and more things like that that machines are doing, and many of those pictures are better than any picture you could ever take because they sort of catch the action at just the right point. So we presume around 2045 that machines will be more intelligent than human beings. Machines will control the future agenda of the world, and the only way we can keep up or figure out what's going on is to combine or merge with them in some way. And with uh, an analogy to black holes in physics, we call this the singularity. So there are various ways to think about this. You remember Alice in Wonderland? In Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, a world is confronted that's much more organic than expected. So playing croquet, everything's alive, right? The ball is alive, and the mallet is alive, and the wicket is alive, and so everything's writhing around, and there's no predictability of how you play croquet because the fact that everything's moving and everything's sentient. And that. So we're facing a world that's entirely the opposite of that, perhaps. In the technological singularity, we face a world that's much less organic than expected and could develop without us. The future may not need us at all, may not need human beings. So now, this technological singularity, there are three main schools of belief about it. What is its basic character? What how could you distill down to a couple of words what the singularity is? One way to think about it is it's accelerating change. It's exponential change. Another way is to think it's this unpredictability of the uh, event uh, horizon use, using an, an analogy with black holes in physics. And the third way of thinking about it is as an intelligence explosion. And so Marcus Hutter has a recent essay, Can Intelligence Explode? So this is one, one of the things that I, yeah, if you're interested in his work, I, I would recommend that you read. And then within those schools, 
there are four mean paths by which the singularity could be reached. And so one is to create an artificial intelligence that exceeds human intelligence. Another is to build a human computer interface that allows humans to go beyond their innate intelligence to a significant extent. This is sometimes called the cybernetic singularity. A third type is to find ways in biology to improve upon the natural human intellect. This is probably the least likely to happen because biology is pretty slow, but that this is another way that this could conceivably happen. And then the fourth way is basically where the internet wakes up, right? One day the internet is just the internet and the next day it's actually making command decisions about the world. So you build a large computer network in which beyond human intelligence emerges. So in the courses in Singularity University in Silicon Valley, one learns about all these various types and themes and, and, and different ways of thinking about uh, the technological singularity. So the experience of attending their courses, which you can do either as a four to nine day executive course or as a nine week uh, graduate course in the summer. And there's a possibility that some of the people, or at least one of the people in this class may end up taking that course. Um, really covers all, all these, ver uh, really all the subjects in the course and, and the things I'm talking about uh, today. Now the main protagonist of the idea of the technological singularity is Ray Kurzweil. And every now and then at a party or something where people are doing a lot of talking, you'll find somebody talking about how narrow the views of Ray Kurzweil are and, you know, it's really stupid and doesn't he realize this or that. And I'm just giving a little heads up here. That argument doesn't work, okay? The reason that it doesn't work is the following. That... Uh, he wrote a book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, and there was a lot of uh, spirited criticism after this book. He spent the next several years answering all of the critiques that he got in a very organized way, and then wrote another book just based on all the research he had done, answering these people's uh, criticisms, and so you wouldn't find that necessarily you have a bright idea that he's never thought of. This is extremely unlikely, or that your thinking is much broader than his. This is also extremely unlikely, because he has spent over a decade now answering other people's criticisms of his theory, usually by agreeing with part of what they say, disagreeing with another part, and then giving them something that they never thought about as sort of food for thought. And so he is reachable, you can write to him, that's the other thing. If you hear somebody talking about the fact that, you know, this guy's in an ivory tower, he really doesn't know what's going, he, he does not walk around with any uh, security at all. I think sometimes he will need to, but he, he hasn't needed to yet. So just an ordinary person like you, he's still, you know, approachable. So um, it's important to realize that. And he is as flexible and as, as, as familiar with all these various approaches and thoughts and various ways of looking at things as uh, anyone else in the field. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go into history now a little bit, this whole idea the relationship between humans and machines. And most of the next 20 odd slides come from Marcus uh, Hutter's talk. So you'll hear it again from him. Uh, so the first person probably to talk about uh, the replacement of human functions by machines 
was a guy by the name of R. Thornton, right, who was the editor of something called the Expounder of Primitive Christianity. How is that for a reference? You will see very many references from that. Um, and he wrote about the recent invention of the four-function mechanical calculator. Such machines by which the scholars may, by turning a crank, grind out the solution of a problem without the fatigue of mental application, would, by its introduction into schools, do incalculable injury. But who knows that such machines, when brought to greater perfection, may not think of a plan to remedy all their own defects, and then grind out ideas beyond the ken of mortal mind. So you see, in 1847, this idea of machines replacing human beings was already out there and just based in the four-function calculator. Um, Darwin's origin of species, of course, made, made a big difference in terms of people's thinking about things. And a writer by the name of Samuel Butler published a letter that was entitled Darwin Amongst the Machines. And as a kind of joke or, or in a joking way, he compared human evolution to machine evolution and prophesied half in jest that machines would eventually replace man in the, in the supremacy of the earth saying, in the course of ages, we shall find ourselves the inferior race. And the letter raises many of the themes now being debated by proponents of the technological singularity. He also wrote a novel called Erewhon, which you'll recognize is nowhere spelled backwards. And um, in that, he said, there's no security against the ultimate development of mechanical consciousness. In the fact of machines pos possessing little consciousness now, a mollusk has not much consciousness. Reflect upon the extraordinary advance which machines have made during the last few hundred years and note how slowly the animal and vegetable kingdoms are advancing. <laughs> The more highly organized machines are creatures not so much of yesterday as of the last five minutes, so to speak, in comparison with past time. So the idea has been out there, but it, it really didn't become a popular idea or something that, that most people in intellectual circles were aware of until the 1950s, 1960s. And uh, Stanislaw Ulam and I.J. Good were the first people to use this idea of the technological singularity. And uh, probably the best known person still living today is Werner Vinge, who's a science fiction writer. And then the widespread popularization of this came with the books of Ray Kurzweil, which is the age of spiritual machines in 99. Um, the uh, singularity is, is near in 2005, and his recent book on um, the mind and how to build one. Um, in terms of events, the Singularity Summit began in 2006, and it is the most popular uh, meeting at which these things are discussed. Um, and something called the Singularity Institute that, as I told you yet yesterday, has just been taken over by uh, the Singularity University. So there are fewer entities out there than there used to be. David Chalmers, who's a very famous uh, philosopher, um, has recently gotten interested in this area in 2010. And so Marcus Hutter and his writing re refers heavily uh, to David Chalmers. And in the next few slides that I've borrowed from Marcus Hutter, he had me at the end put references to both his own work and uh, 
David Chalmers. So I think a lot of his, his work does derive from uh, Chalmers. This is Moore's Law, the, the idea that there's this uh, exponential um, progress in, in uh, computer performance, many other things. So uh, computer power doubling every year and a half. It's now been valid for 50 years. Uh, as long as there's demand for more computational resources, probably Moore's Law will continue. As I told you yesterday, it doesn't apply uh, on Tuesday. It, it doesn't apply perfectly in medicine. There are lots of inhibitory forces in medicine that, that, that make it not work quite as, as uh, well there. Um, so in 20 to 30 years, um, the raw computational power of a single computer will reach the computational power of the human brain. And so we presume that both hardware and software will improve and that basically there will be human level artificial intelligence in 20 to 30 years. And you can imagine a kind of different pace of uh, doubling patterns. In the Stone Age, there was a doubling every 250,000 years. <laughs> In the era of agricultural economy and farming, it was every 900 years. In the Industrial Revolution, every 15 years. In the computer-dominated society, it was every 1.5 years. And you can imagine when we reach superhuman intelligence, there'll be um, uh, doubling maybe every month, um, that, that this doubling will, will increase very, very rapidly as we get closer to 2045. Ray Kurzweil has talked about these six epics. We're currently in epic four, the, um, the epoch of technology. We'll next be in Epoch 5, where technology and human intelligence merge. And then Epoch 6 is where the universe wakes up, uh, where basically everything, uh, the, the entire universe is uh, computerized and uh, connected. Um, so. Is the singularity negotiable? Can we stop it? Um, is it already inevitable? And this is quite an interesting slide. You might want to pour over a bit. Um, but it is probably inevitable. Um, it's hard to know exactly when the point of no return will be reached. And as we talked about on Tuesday, there are still things that could wipe out all of humankind <laughs> before we reach it, but that's probably not very likely to happen. How, how do we figure this out, whether, whether we've reached the point of no return? The two analogies Hutter uses are uh, global warming. You can imagine that in theory we have the power to stop that, but actually we, we probably won't for a lot of reasons. And similarly, as a spaceship gets close to a black hole, if it had unlimited propulsion, could have as much propulsion as it wanted, it would be able to escape and not go into the black hole. But it, it, uh, it, it, it ends up there because of limited uh, propulsion. This is maybe one of the toughest slides, and so I'm not going to spend much time on it. But. Have you ever thought of a library containing all books? Would you like to have a library containing all books? Not just all correct books, but all the misprinted books, all the books printed where the printer didn't work, and all, all the ones. And so in other words, everything that people would have wanted to discard, and, and, every, and so every conceivable book. In theory, you couldn't find anything there. So that, according to Marcus Hutter, there's this idea of the Library of Babel, which you can look up on uh, Wikipedia. And it says that the library of all conceivable books would be just as worthless as not having any books at all. 
and and it and it does give you this this idea of you know that uh, information overload in, in its extreme could conceivably make it impossible for you to find the information that you need. Um, and a society of increasing intelligence from the outside, from people who are, do not have augmented intelligence, the activities of that society would just look like white noise. It would be completely chaotic and un, uninterpretable when viewed from the outside. And these are the first views of what the singularity would look like, would sound like. I know it, it, it sounds pretty simple, but actually no one had ever come up with these ideas before Marcus Hutter had them. I think he's young enough to realize that the problem with the singularity up until that point is when somebody tells you about it, it's so vague, it gives you nothing tangible, and so you leave the room with nothing to really remember. What is this thing, you know? If you don't know what it would look like, what it would sound like, any of those things, then have you really learned anything? So, so at least through Marcus Hutter, we're, we're, we're getting some idea of maybe what it would look like, what it would sound like. So what, which way would it go? Would it expand internally or externally? And you can argue it either way. Um, is it something as we approach the singularity that we're doing uh, to, to uh, transform the external world? Is it something happening internally within us through miniaturization, virtual reality? I guess historically mankind has always been outward exploring, but you could imagine it occurring either way. A strict intelligence singularity would be neither experienced by the insiders or the outsiders. So the, the people within it, their functioning would just increase and they wouldn't necessarily notice it. It would seem like normal life to them. It's just they're thinking much faster than the people outside, but it would seem normal to them. And to the people outside, um, there, there wouldn't be anything uh, understandable about what was going on. I brought today this, this ant, <laughs> so you'll be seeing, seeing him again, uh, the, the uh, robotic dog that, that you'll meet on Tuesday will interact with the ant. There are various you know, analogies people have used about what it will be like when machines are smarter than we are. But I mean, one is uh, that then the relationship between machines and us will be like the, the relationship between us and ants now, or us and you know, grasshoppers now. I think ants are probably better because their society is better characterized. If I were to ask any of you, you know, how ants live, you'd have some knowledge of that. Uh, grasshoppers, it's a little bit vague. Um, so there, there, there may be this kind of problem, as I said Tuesday, about human insignificance because we, we will no longer be the smartest people around. What is intelligence? This is something that Marcus Hutter and his colleagues have spent a lot of time uh, working on. Uh, Leg and Hunter and Hutter, Leg and Hutter in 2007 provided a collection of more than 70 um, definitions of what intelligence is. It must be more than speed. Um, there, are, there are lots of, of individuals who've tried to come up with a, a definition of what, what intelligence is. What will super intelligences do? That's another way of thinking about it, you know, when you're very, very intelligent, what do you then do? Um, and it, it's rather hard to define. If you think of it giving you an advantage in mating, actually in human beings now, you can't show that at all. The people who have more children have a lower IQ than the people. So, and, so it's, 
it's not defined as just reproductive success. Um, in uh, animals, some, some of it is correlated with uh, the chance of survival, the number of offspring. Now probably we're evolving through ideas, through means, r rather than progeny. Um, so the genetic evolution has been replaced by mimetic uh, evolution. What activities are intelligent? What activities does evolution select for? Um, and it's interesting to think about bacteria. We don't consider bacteria very intelligent, but each of you has in your body more bacterial cells than your own cells. And in a lot of ways, they, they, they are quite successful. They're just not very smart, right? So we have to be careful that we don't apply some sort of definition of uh, uh, intelligence that um, uh, bacteria would, would um, fulfill. Is intelligence rationality, reasoning toward a goal? Um, and how do you reward uh, the individual doing the reasoning? Uh, you can imagine in robots, for instance, you could reward it as something hardwired, that they do something and they get a reward, or you could have it uh, rewarded by the, the individual teaching the robot. So who sets the goals for superintelligences and how? No matter how we do it, we'll ultimately lose control, right? Because as they become smarter than we are, <laughs> we are not going to be able to control what goals they set for themselves later on. And so this is this whole idea of unfriendly AI. And is unfriendly AI the biggest challenge out there? I would argue that human insignificance is probably a greater challenge than unfriendly AI. It's possible, just possible, that just by allowing AI to develop naturally, it will be mostly friendly to humans. After all, it's created mostly by humans in the, in the beginning. So maybe that problem of unfriendly AI will solve itself. But the problem of human insignificance because the machines are so much smarter than we are is not an easily solvable problem. So the uh, evolving goals, uh, you can assume that the initial virtual world will be a society of cooperating and competing agents. Maybe the competing ones will win out. Um, so the successful virtual agents will spread in various ways and the others will perish. Soon this virtual society will consist mainly of virtuals who com whose goal is to compete over resources. Hostility, hostility will be limited only if it's in the virtual's best interest. Like, the reason we're not constantly hostile, the reason you don't attack every other human being you see in the hallway, is you just strategically realize it's not the best way. That, that, that usually leads to both people losing, whereas you, if you try to um, strategically gain an advantage uh, through economic uh, competition. This usually allows at least one party to win, whereas if it's just physical struggle, usually both sides lose. So the goal is to survive and spread, but in a way different from uh, bacteria somehow. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's somewhat hard to figure out what the aim should be. There are alternative societies you could think of where you can mandate um, various types of uh, behavior, but forcing people to conform is also almost as bad, maybe, as, as having constant strife. I mean, the idea of human beings like a flock of sheep or a school of fish is not very uh, attractive. You can think of individual virtual worlds that are very homogeneous. And maybe one thing that makes uh, intelligence 
um, maybe its salient characteristic is how uh, adaptive it is. So Marcus Hutter ended up feeling that uh, the best definition of intelligence is the ability to achieve goals in a wide variety of, of environments. This is something that is testable, that uh, can be rigorously formalized in mathematical terms. When we get to virtual intelligences, there will be no limit in how many we can create. It becomes very easy to re reproduce them, very cheap. And one thing that means, um, it, it, when copying and modifying is so easy, um, the value of life will decrease. Um, the moral code uh, will change, presumably. Um, <clears throat> and there, there, this is maybe the most distressing thing about his vision, is the value of everything that we currently value a great deal, like human life, will become much less in a society where it's easy to reproduce minds and most of them are virtual and not uh, biological. So in, in games, for instance, um, we value virtual life uh, less than real life because games can be reset and one can be resurrected. So the consequences of cheap life uh, you, you, you would be engage, engaging in a lot of risk-taking activity because you could easily make a backup copy of yourself. Uh, and you can imagine that in many ways, um, behavior and uh, morality would be greatly changed if um, life begins to have so little meaning. And um, why would you be paid a salary for the work you do when a, a machine can do that work much better and basically for free? So there are many, many implications. Right now, we have a lot of um, rules about messing with, with, with the brain, doing doing experiments, but in a circumstance where um, artificial intelligence is so pl plentiful, maybe um, laws preventing experimentation with, with intelligence for moral reasons may not uh, emerge. So with so little value assigned to an individual life, maybe it becomes a, a disposable commodity. How do we figure these things out? Are there universal values and what would they be then? Are there any universal values that would define what we want to survive? What do we mean by we? Do we mean all humans or the dominant species or a government at the time the question is asked? Could it be diversity that, that, that is really what, what is most valuable that we want to retain? Or friendly AI? Could the long-term survival of at least one conscious species that appreciates its surrounding universe be a universal value? Well, right about now, I think you'd be feeling very depressed, right? So you need something simple to pick you up. So <laughs> now, so, but, but this has given you a taste of what Marcus Hutter's lecture on Valentine's Day will be like, okay? So you're prepared now, and now we're gonna talk about something fun which is uh, trying to raise spirits and stimulate interest in uh, the singularity through a new holiday, Future Day. So this was tried for the first time last year, and here we are um, with Joel Crichton uh, celebrating in, in an evening, and we, we had quite a complex uh, celebration and many different uh, venues and uh, that banner still exists or two copies of the banner and so on and so forth. So um, 
We were one of 16 places celebrating this holiday. It hasn't spread very much. It spread to Melbourne, Sydney, Hong Kong, Berkeley, Edmonton, Houston, Hawaii, Sao Paulo, Thanksgiving Point, Utah. I didn't know that place existed before. Brussels, Paris, LA, Palo Alto, Washington, Carleton, Australia, and Warclaw, Poland. So I think this year will probably be celebrated in more places. But I, I think that's another unique thing about the course. We're celebrating a holiday very, very few people have heard of. And uh, if it becomes famous someday, you'll be able to say that, geez, you know, I, I celebrated it in 2013. Would you believe it? Um, so uh, this episode of the Big Bang Theory from October 1st, 2010, you, you can purchase it, you can watch it. Uh, it's quite interesting. It actually uses the term technological singularity. And there it is. You see the uh, singularity word in a little cloud there. And um, that episode was also sort of cool because Woz, the other Apple co-founder, uh, ha has a, a cameo part in that particular uh, episode. So it's it just kind of a fun thing. When I first started to think about how many people we could reach, it was really uh, the Big Bang Theory and its uh, viewership that I thought was the most we could reach. I realize now that the PBS uh, Nova program is a much better uh, metric and, of course, a much larger number. There are 100 million people watching uh, that PBS program and only 30 million watch the Big Bang Theory. Now, to create a new holiday, it has to be visually appealing, has to be different from everything else, has to have pageantry and ceremony and a bunch of stuff specific to it. And I don't know how many of you have ever experienced the Holi Festival, Holi Festival in the Asian uh, subcontinent. But it, it's quite unlike anything we do here. They scatter uh, brightly colored pigments all over each other. It's a structured society where many groups don't talk to each other except on that day when everybody is included and you know the janitor or the person that you would ordinarily never interact with is still a part of this. And you're sprinkling all these brightly colored pigments on them. And this is part of what it looks like. Now let's think about this from a medical point of view. Originally, these pigments all came from plants. They were non-toxic, it was great. But how easy would it be for any of you to go out and find a plant that's as brightly colored as that? That would be kind of tough, right? Whereas you could find paints that are brightly colored really easily, but probably those paints are toxic. So now there are a lot of medical conditions caused by people using these, these, these paints and sprinkling each other with paints. And so you get eye, eye disease and lung disease and heart disease and you know, skin disease that, uh, from these uh, pigments. So I'm not saying we need to do this. I'm just saying we, need to, we would need to do something to make this uh, different from everything else. Here, here are just some other pictures. You, I would say, have never been in a circumstance like this. Not a circumstance quite as colorful as this, or perhaps quite as medically scary as this, or like this. Uh, you haven't been in quite the circumstance that this guy is, is in. Um, so these have captured your you know, imagination visually because of the bright colors, but there are many other ways to do that besides sprinkling pigments. And uh, one um, has to do with, with this poem. And any of you who have been to my Facebook page will know that there is only uh, one poem. <laughs> There's only ever been one poem. And it's this poem. And it's kind of interesting. Um, Robert Fulgham wrote this poem, but it has been modified, and everywhere you'll find it, it's quite a bit different from what he wrote. What he wrote has many off-putting parts. So people have taken out that and just left this, which gives you quite a nice feeling, I think. We should develop a Crayola bomb as our next secret weapon. 
a happiness weapon, a beauty bomb, and every time a crisis developed, we would launch one, would explode high in the air, explode softly, and send thousands, millions of little parachutes into the air, floating down to Earth, boxes of Crayolas. And we wouldn't go cheap either. Boxes of 64 with a sharpener built right in with silver and gold and copper and magenta and peach and lime and amber and umber and all the rest. And the people would smile and get a funny look on their faces and cover the world with imagination. So if that colorful image doesn't do it for you, did you know that the Roomba robotic vacuum cleaner, if you do time-lapse art, you get these kinds of colorful visuals. And if that's a bit too futuristic for you, then uh, there are these various hot air balloon festivals, which are extreme. I imagine it's kind of expensive to put, put together such a hot air balloon festival, but you could do it once or twice, I guess. And you'd need songs, you'd need poems. What about the windmill of your mind? Maybe, maybe that's a good one. Uh, round, like the circle in a spiral, like a wheel within a wheel, never ending or beginning on an ever-spending reel like a snowball down a mountain, or a carnival balloon like a car carousel that's turning, running rings around the moon, like a clock whose hands are sweeping past the minutes of its face. World is like an apple whirling silently in space like the circles that you'll find in the windmills of your mind. So I would welcome your suggestions. First of all, is this future day a good idea? What are your ideas about how to make it special? What sort of ceremony, pageantry, what visuals? I mean, you, you can think of the visuals we have for you know, Halloween, Christmas, New Year's, uh, Thanksgiving, you know, Easter. Um, it, it, it needs to have something that the general public would, would, would find is unique to it. And it's kind of a funny concept, isn't it? Because the future is always in the future, right? All these other things commemorate something that happened at a particular time. By commemorating the future, you're, you're, you're always looking forward. It's, it's a little bit more nebulous than what all, all the other uh, holidays um, commemorate. So, how can we capture the imagination of the public to start everybody thinking about these matters? Does a new holiday uh, have some promise in that regard? We need the mainstream public to regard the future singularity as fact, not fiction, and we need to promote organized thinking about the future in uh, the universities and beyond. And these are uh, the references to Marcus Hutter's work that's sort of in the center of this, the part where you got deeply, deeply depressed, <laughs> that's the Marcus Hutter part, and the uh, Kim Sola's part was the beginning and the end where I brought you out of your oblivion. So, uh, so anyway, uh, so I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions. We have uh, 22 minutes, so there's quite, quite a lot of time for questions. It can be both specifically about this lecture, it can be other things about the course. If you suddenly had this moment of angst where you wondered what the hell you're doing here and you <laughs> just want to <laughs> ask some general question, you, you, you can also ask that. So um, there's a microphone there and there. And uh, so any thoughts? Ross? Yeah. Yeah, so at one point we mentioned, or you mentioned, uh, that the internet may become intelligent. That's one way that artificial intelligence may you know, come about. Yes. And uh, I haven't read too much about that particular method, but I was thinking about it since then, and maybe you can explain it a little further. But in this analogy, is the internet itself like, like a brain and individuals connected to the internet are like neurons? And so the whole system, like 
because I can't imagine that Google would just suddenly have an intelligent agent that you can ask <laughs> questions to. But I could imagine that something like Twitter really is your way of communicating to other nodes. Yeah. I, I think it could come about in lots of different ways. Of course, unpredictability is part of what you would expect from something that's truly intelligent. And there already is that. If you look at packet traffic, it, it's not absolutely predictable. So there already are kind of unexpected things happening in terms of the actual functioning of the internet. But we're talking about at a larger level, the, the internet starting to make decisions. Well, what do we mean exactly? The internet is already making decisions. It decides which ads to put beside your Facebook page based on what you've purchased before. You know, there are lots of other decisions that the internet's already making, some of which you, you, you may not like very much when you start to realize that although it's keeping your Gmail private from other human beings, it's going through it to see what your themes are and then offering you new things. You know, it's just between the software and, and, and you, right? But it seems to know quite, quite a lot about you. So in a sense, that's all already ha happening. But I guess in a sense where it would begin to control the uh, agenda of the world, then it would be deciding big things. Like, I, I, I don't know if this would ha happen, but how would you know that the machines have taken over? People have talked about the rapid uh, greening. I mean, what if they decided we need a lot more green stuff around and oxygen? So you just <laughs> suddenly find that the whole world's becoming green. You know, it, there's stuff growing everywhere. Or something really obvious like that. So, so to go beyond the presenting of ads to you based on what you talk about and what the software thinks are the prevailing themes in your life to something much bigger where, where, where it is making decisions for, you know, governments, countries, this sort of thing. Um, I don't know where it presents an uh, ultimatum to you know, the U.S. Congress or something, like, sort of like, it, what's that called, the Forbin pro Project, the 1960s movie about this supercomputer that, that, that um, one in the U.S. and one in Russia starts to decide to uh, take over the world, that sort of thing. Um, so, is that a likely way? I, I don't really think that we know what is the most likely way in which uh, uh, the singularity may, may emerge. I suppose your own personal view on this would depend upon how irksome you find the ads that are tailored to you to be. So. Well, in that sense, you made a good point about how the internet is intelligent already in a sense. But right. So maybe there's a fifth option, and it's that we need to, you know, we need to say that humans aren't intelligent in the classical way that we define intelligence, right? Like, in the same way that, you know, you can ask me what my preferences are and I can, I can tell you what products I might like, but is that any different than a search engine doing it for me? Mm -hmm. So am I really intelligent or am I just a very complicated black box? Yes, yes. Well, no, I, I think part of what you find when uh, Earl Waugh talks in this course is we're not just getting insights about uh, uh, technology from these discussions. We're getting insights about what we're really made of, you know, what makes us tick, what makes us uniquely different from other beings in the world. And uh, are we really changing? Is you know, technology changing us. Uh, there are arguments both ways. Uh, you've probably read in the past week about uh, feeling naked without your phone. There are probably more than half the people in the world now, if they suddenly find <laughs> that they don't have their phone, they feel naked. They, they, they feel that they can't function, they're, they're uneasy until they're reunited with their phone again. So does this mean that we're basically different? 
I don't know. You know, like, think of the preoccupation with the mess created by horses. At one time in, in, in the history of, of our society, this was the big problem. You know, the horses were fouling the cities. What are we going to do about this? It seemed like a, 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 an insoluble problem. And yet, within a few years, people weren't using horses anymore. It sort of took care of itself, you know? So our, is the problem of nakedness caused, caused by not having your phone a greater change than you being preoccupied by there are too many darn horses and, and everywhere you walk, there's evidence of a horse. And this is just, you know, something terrible happening in the world. Are those two equivalent? Certainly, there were big meetings about the problem of horses, just like there, there, there are big meetings now about what's happening to human beings with uh, you know, technology advance. Are there other questions? Yeah. You want to go to a microphone? Thanks. I was just wondering if the um, level at which technology is at is quantifiable. So can we know at what stage we're at now relative to, say, 2045 or wherever, wherever, whenever it is? Is there a way of measuring that? You mean, can, can we put a number on it? Well, we, we'll talk about clout later, I guess. This putting a number on things is, is interesting. I think. If you want to talk about me as a force for evil or good, maybe the moment when I talked in this class about clout and people who had never heard of it before started signing up, maybe I, I did something evil. So clout uh, takes your significance in the world, your online significance, and puts a number on it. And if we can do that for individuals, then why can't we do it for all of society and say right now, the technological advancement is currently, you know, uh, on a scale of 0 to 100, we're 55.96, you know, and something will happen. It, I, I, we, we can't really quantitate it like that now because so nobody's trying. Wouldn't that method be more of people's connectivity to technology rather than the uh, level of intelligence that technology has reached? Yeah, but you, you I, I think... Anything you decided that you wanted to try to develop a metric for, the people who brought you clout would be happy to create this new metric and charge, charge you for it and, and make it proprietary and secret so you wouldn't know exactly how they did it. So I, I think it, it is in theory possible to come up with numbers that would kind of generally summarize whatever attribute you might like to see out there. Um, yeah, so um, why, why, why do you ask that though? Why, why well, would as, a, as a scientist, I'm quite evidence-based. Yes. And quantitation yeah. of anything is, is quite important to me. Have you been to the library recently. There are books on evidence-based medicine. They're covered with dust. No, nobody's reading about it. It's not sexy anymore. So uh, tacit knowledge is what is sexy now. And tacit knowledge in medicine, it's just like an outfielder in baseball catching a ball. I suppose you could do that by formulas and calculus and figure out, well, I should put my hands here according, but that's not how you do it. And, and so you can teach somebody else how to do it by showing them, but you can't teach them in words. You, 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 and so there are many things in medicine like that, and that's tacit knowledge, and that's really where the action is. So people are doing research on ta ta tacit knowledge. There, there, there's, there's basically, you know, the research on evidence-based medicine was in the 50s and 60s. That's why, you know, everybody bought it then and so on. We all think that that's what we're doing. But it's a tremendous amount of medicine that cannot be evidence-based, just like catching a ball in an outfield, which may win the game. It's not evidence-based. It's not based on a bunch of the 
theories and studies of, well, should you catch the ball this way or that way? It, it's based on actually learning a skill. Yeah, I think, I think that's partially correct. But in my experience, um, my team, for example, is in incredibly evidence-based. Um, yeah. And I think you still need to be strongly evidence-based if you want people to start doing what you want them, what, what you think should be done in order, in order for improvements to be made in medicine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, I still believe wholeheartedly in evidence-based right. science. Yeah, well, I, I, I think uh, the metric, I mean, if you want to say, well, what's the actual proof that machines are smarter than hum human beings? Well, for instance, you can take the Jeopardy earnings and look what happened over the three days that Watson played. And you, you can imagine if he kept on playing as it, uh, against the top human contenders, you, you can create a sort of curve those earnings have some relationship to the kind of, you know, Jeopardy game related, you know, intelligence that was being, uh, you know, displayed there. So, so it is an actual, you know, numeric quantity that, that you can follow. Wouldn't, wouldn't the Jeopardy scenario, though, wouldn't that be more of a space information thing rather than a level of imaginative intelligence where someone creates an answer rather than just plucks it out of a knowledge well it, it isn't simple if you watch jeopardy it's a tremendous waste of time of course i would respect you more if you've never watched jeopardy never seen but if you ever do watch jeopardy they do puns and jokes and uh, you know sound alike things and there, there are a bunch of things that that are quite challenging it's, it's not just knowledge. It, a, a lot of it is the way the question is framed and being able to, you know, interpret language. Um, so it, it, it is quite challenging, and there is no question that machines are better at it than uh, human beings a, a, as of, uh, you know, February 2011, and will always be from here on out. And machines are better than chess. You, you can better at chess, you, you can, there are various uh, metrics of uh, chess playing that, that you could show that, you know, uh, um, machines are better there. So then, it's a matter of whatever activity that human beings conduct now. Uh, for instance, I, I, I spoke uh, last time about the taking of pictures. You know, you can win awards for a good picture, you can put them on Flickr and have people vote on them, all, all those sorts of ways. You, you could take, if we had an actual human photographer here, you, you could compare the still pictures that this camera is taking with what that human photographer is doing and, and how pleasing it is to an audience or something, and that camera would usually win. Um, so there, there, Has that been done? <laughs> what, what was that? Has that been done? Yeah, well, I, as I pointed out, the, the, the picture of Osmer uh, Zayan sort of doing this that we have, I, I think it, 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 you would have had to work very hard as a human uh, photographer to capture just that moment. There's... Uh, uh, a picture of David uh, uh, Zakis from the last time that we met here on, on Tuesday. It's one of the best pictures of him taken in a long time. I, I'm not saying that that's, that that's proof, but I, I think you could come up with that proof, and, and you'll probably see it yourself. As you ask more and more questions, with this camera focused on you, then your friends and associates will find one of those pictures of you taken by this camera to probably be, you know, superior to other pictures that lowly humans have taken of you in the past. Depending on how happy and, uh, you know, at ease you are, if you're completely pissed off and, and completely out of, out of balance, then it, then it won't work uh, because the, the machine can't fix everything. Okay. Okay? Are there other... Questions? Yes, yes, good. Hey. 
So you know how you said that eventually, like in the near future, technology is going to be smarter than us? So why exactly should we celebrate the future day, in a sense? Because that's our own demise, right? Because <laughs> we're just... Yeah, no, no, no I, I take that point. But don't you think it's simpler than that? that the same sort of thing where technology will be wonderful in the short term and absolutely terrible in the long term exists for almost anything you can think of. Take my job. Okay, I look at kidney pathology slides. That's my day job, okay? And you can imagine that over the next few years, technology is going to make that easier, that I'll be able to share pictures easier and so on. And then the day will come when the machine's going to wake up and say, Dr. Soles, you know, you made a bunch of mistakes, actually, and didn't you realize this, that, and the other thing? And why don't you let me try it now? And then the machine's going to be better than I am from that point onward. So it will have enhanced my life greatly up until that point. It's sort of a friend, right? It, it will assist me more and more in the work that I do. It's going to be absolutely great. It's going to make me a much better renal pathologist than I was before. But at some point, it's going to realize it doesn't need me anymore. And any job you might think of, that's probably the sequence that we're talking about, where first it uh, makes things better, makes things easier, cheaper, work better in every way, and then ultimately it will you know, replace us. Yeah, so cool. by celebrating Future Day, I'm, I'm, I'm saying probably the same thing exists for every other holiday. You think holidays are completely positive? There are more suicides around uh, uh, holidays because holidays assume you have a loving family and a network, and if you don't, you may feel deeply depressed, right? So that, that, that there are bad aspects of the holidays. So this would not, I, I suppose, if we're celebrating the future, and if you're really frightened of the future, then yeah, but it could still help you prepare for, for the future, right? Yeah, but even so, what do you think will happen once we become like inert to technology? You know, like human as a whole. Like, we'll just be lying around while machines do everything for us. Like, well, the, the idea is to be on permanent vacation, right? To, be, to have society support you because it's good to have, have you around without you needing to work your entire life. This would be the lot of most the human beings. And depending upon how naturally lazy you are, that may sound fantastic, you know, but on, on the other hand, it depends upon could you keep life interesting. A lot of people think of themselves, if you say, well, who are you? tell me about yourself, you start telling about the job that you do. What if there is no job? You know, you're watching virtual reality, which by that time is as good as the real reality, so you're living ideal human experiences, but that's all you do. You know, you're, you're playing games, you're having fun, you're, you're, you're enriching your mind, but you're not actually doing anything your entire life. So it, it, depending on how you think about that, it's like the worst nightmare or, or, or the most fantastic pleasant dream, depending on how exactly it, it might work. Um, yeah, so in um, one way to think about it, I mean, if you look at James Hughes' uh, presentation here where he was talking about this possible gap between the time that machines take over all jobs and the time that post-scarcity uh, and you know, abundance comes in. But what if he's wrong? The, the, the alternative is that you lose a relatively boring job and get a much more interesting one. That, that's what's tended to happen in the future. And maybe those much more interesting jobs, we just don't know about them yet. But there'll be a whole bunch of things for human beings to do once you know, machines take over most ordinary jobs. Maybe that will happen. So I, I think that that's part of what we're trying to figure out in this course. 
is there going to be a gap? Is, is the future for hum, human beings terrible because of uh, machines, or is it wonderful, or somewhere in between? So that's what we're trying to figure out in this course. I believe our time is up, so thank you very much, and we'll see you on Tuesday for the first AI lecture.